lecture is really based upon uh, w one of my chapters from my um, PhD thesis, which I recently submitted. So it's looking at a uh, municipal government in 19th century Belfast, or during the late 19th century Belfast, when I would argue is the golden age of municipal government. And there's been very little research on Belfast in, as, a, in, as a British urban city. As compared with the kind of, there's been so much focus on the, um, the political sectarian dimension. And really, my research has been part of um, what's been a broader um, a broader shift maybe over the last few years, whereby we've been looking at Belfast as a as a, an urban centre, and how it's it's very interesting when we compare it with what was going on across the water. <coughs> so let's get started. The narrative of the late Victorian and Edwardian years as the golden age of the British city, and more specifically urban self-government, has received notable attention by historians. During this period, municipal authorities in towns and cities were tasked with confronting the problems of unprecedented population growth and responding accordingly. This was very much during the period whenever um, local government had much more, um, when it was essentially being given a lot of responsibility from central government. The second half of the 19th century is particularly noteworthy, with a spirit of municipal activism taking hold that, that led local councils to expand and extend their areas of responsibility. Such activism is best epitomised in Birmingham, where Joseph Chamberlain served as mayor from 1876 and both preached and put into action what has been termed the, munis the municipal gospel. Of course, this energy and vision of Chamberlain was not lost in other towns and cities, including Belfast. And as I've already mentioned, the importance of Belfast as an urban centre, as I'm sure you will all be aware, it's very, uh, it's, it's made up and its growth was very, was, was extraordinary and certainly very different to the rest of Ireland. Um, I think this is best summed up in a quote by Patrick Buckland, who argued, argued that during the 19th century, Belfast was a typical English industrial rather than Irish town. And um, the description by um, the French writer, um, Paul Dubois in 1911 of Belfast is, gives you an idea of this when he said, with its red brick and smoke blackened buildings after the American pattern, the factories and palaces that this worker city resembles <coughs> Liverpool or Glasgow rather than an Irish town. David Owen, David Owen writing in 1912 made the following judgment of Belfast Corporation during the last 30 years of the 19th century. In all departments of its work, improvements were made which materially enhanced the comfort and convenience of the citizens and which raised the town to a foremost position among the municipalities of the United Kingdom. During this period, the corporation made a number of noteworthy achievements. For example, it purchased the gas works in 1874 for 386,000 pounds. It demolished Hercules Street and surrounding area to build Royal Avenue, of which I'll speak a bit more, uh, more in a moment. <coughs> it opened a number of public amenities, including baths, parks, and a free public library. It completed a main drainage scheme for Belfast, <coughs> and developed plans for the erection of Belfast City Hall, which eventually opened in 1906, and which was essentially um, paid for from the profits of the Gasworks venture, of essentially the Golden Egg. Yet for all these noteworthy achievements, public health and sanitation has normally been seen as the area in which Belfast Corporation most notably failed to meet its responsibilities. And essentially in my talk today, I wish to discuss um, its record in managing public health during this period, outlining um, the growth of, um, of um, public health legislation, how it affected Belfast, and look at some of the major developments, some of which I've already mentioned and generally just try and assess what was the performance of Belfast Corporation during this period. That's just an idea of the, what I was talking about, this kind of municipal gospel. It gives you an idea, this is very much okay, what's happening in Belfast here, it's going on elsewhere. But look at, for example, Belfast City Hall, very much it's all in response to um, the, the municipal policies that are being built um, across the water, where it's in Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, etc. Um, municipal activism, it's all about competing with other cities at this time and showing that you're, um, you're as good if not better. Public health and sanitation was arguably the greatest challenge for municipal government in managing an urban centre. The importance of this subject came to prominence in Britain during the mid-19th century through the work of the sanitary reformer Edwin Chadwick. Through his campaigning, government slowly started to take an increasing interest in matters of public health 
culminating in the Public Health Acts of 1848 and 1875, which gave local government powers to deal with health, sewage, drainage, and other matters relating to the health, the sanitation, and the well-being of citizens. Indeed, the first medical officer of, of health position was created in Liverpool in 1847, with William Henry Duncan being appointed. It is unsurprising to note that Irish urban centres lagged behind their English counterparts. This, this was the case in most aspects of municipal governments. It wasn't just restricted to public health. Matthew, Pot Matthew Potter, um, a historian who's worked on the uh, on municipal governments in Ireland, states that the public health movement in Ireland got underway during the 1870s with the introduction of two important pieces of legislation. Firstly, the Public Health Ireland Act of 1874, followed by the Public Health Ireland Act of 1878. The former established the network of rural and urban sanitary authorities, and the latter act gave sanitary authorities, such as Belfast Corporation, explicit powers to provide a sewage network, provide a cleansing service, and jurisdiction over infectious diseases, to name but a few. So Belfast Corporation was appointed the sanitary authority for Belfast. As a borough, however, it's important to note that um, Belfast had a fair amount of latitude to take action on, pub on public health at any time after 1842. 1842 being when um, Belfast was um, um, first municipal corporation or elected municipal corporation was created. The 1874 Act, this Public Health Act of 1874, was important mainly for the large number of Irish urban centres that did not have the corporate status owing to the very strict nature of Irish municipal reform compared to England. So the point that he made here is that uh, despite this legislation in the 1870, um, 1870s, which really put increasing pressure on municipal authorities to do more to tackle um, municipal health, yet the point being made that as far back as the 1840s, Belfast Corporation um, could have um, um, had, technically had the powers whereby it, it could invest in various urban sanitary um, works but it actually chose not to. Just generally speaking here I should be made, uh, I should make the point really that um, in looking at um, public health in Belfast uh, the point to be made here is that um, W.A. McGuire in his book talks about urban growth created urban problems and really this, this story is about um, Belfast that um, has extraordinary growth across, across the century. In 1801 there was about a population of 19,000, approximately 19,000 by a hundred years later, it was about 350,000. So extraordinary population growth. And really what we're, really what we're discussing here is how municipal authority um, responds to such extraordinary growth. And uh, inevitably it's challenging, but, um, uh, and this is really the story I'm trying to look at. The picture of Belfast health and sanitation in the first half of the 19th century was illustrated by Dr. Andrew Malcolm. A, pan, a pioneering medical doctor who campaigned to improve the health of citizens in early Victorian Belfast. So really this is the second context and, and he was arguing as far back as the 1850s that um, the, the working classes were living in unsavoury conditions um, which included inadequate drainage, cramped housing conditions with a lack of external ventilation, a limited water supply and poor street cleaning. This was very much the working class masses coming in from the countryside, predominantly up from and down to the new factories they're working, whether it was um, cotton in the linen factories, but the point is that the urban infrastructure um, um, had to grow very quickly and in most cases it was of very poor quality. So what we're looking at during this period in, in the later 19th century is whereby the corporation is really, is really being forced to try and tackle this. And this quote here I think is actually quite interesting. I'll come to Conway Scott was in the public health department of Belfast Corporation. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, what we'll have to think about when we're looking at public health in Belfast during this period is that there's a perception by, by leading, in the, leading sanitary reformers in, in Belfast that West, we'll have made, West Belfast needed a, a lot of improvements to its urban infrastructure. There's also a suggestion that at the same time, Belfast is quite unfortunate due to its geographical position, the high tide, and then there's uh, um, talk of subsoil, and then we're going to talk about people working in mills, and they're working there in a high temperature, and then people live on tea there, and people that kind of particularly susceptible to disease. So the point is, and as much as it, there's always a kind of caveat, where they're saying, yes, we'll have to make these improvements. But on the other hand, you know, Belfast is Belfast, and we can only do so much. So we'll have to think about how far in, um, 
um, such sanitary reformers are actually do, doing their best during this period. To talk about, uh, I would like to move on and talk about, so the Urban Sanitary Authority during this period um, was Belfast Corporation. And a, a committee was created um, that, that would be overseen by the Public Health Committee, and they had a public health department. So I want to talk about who were the major individuals that were running um, the public health department in Belfast at this time. The f following the legislation of the 1870s, the public health department increased to consist of a medical superintendent officer of health, an executive sanitary officer, that was called <coughs> Scott I mentioned. There was to be six sub sanitary officers and nine medical officers who significantly were connected to the Irish poor law dispensaries. And this is an important point to make as well, very much this discussion with Albie. Belfast Corporation is very much responsible for urban, uh, urban infrastructure. Um, decisions such as drainage, um, houses, and uh, infectious diseases when it comes to actually, um, for example, the workhouse, etc., as very much um, a separate domain of the, uh, um, of, of the Irish poor law. So it's separate, and, and this is interesting to look at as well, how far is, um, is there divided responsibility in Belfast when it came to um, public health decisions. The first medical superintendent officer of health was Dr. Samuel Brown a practicing doctor, and he, interestingly, was a former mayor of the town in 1870, and you'll see a bit of a, um, you'll see a bit of a correlation development here. Interestingly, Dr. Samuel Brown was involved in public health as far back as um, 1848, and he, he took it upon himself, and he actually set up a committee to deal with um, um, the to responding to um, the, um, the famine in, in Belfast, or the effects of the famine. Obviously, they were quite different in terms of, it was more, uh, um, you might refer to as um, the urban associated problems that came from the famine due to various um, diseases. So he set up um, this committee, and he very much took it up. So he was, you might say, say the unofficial um, um, medical superintendent as far back as the 1840s, but it was only following this legislation in the 1870s that he was technically employed by Belfast Corporation. But when Brown died in office in 1890, there was controversy because his, his successor was the big Dr. Henry Whitaker, and once again, he was also um, a member of the corporation. He was, there was eight other candidates, and he was the only one that was um, from a from Belfast and also a serving member of uh, of the corporation, and uh, there's been some uh, there's been some suggestion that he, he wasn't the quality he wasn't um, the best qualified individual. First of all, he was quite elderly. He was in his seventies when he was appointed, and he was poorly qualified, and that he hadn't actually practiced medicine for quite a few years. Yet the majority of his council colleagues decided that he was to be the can that he was to be Brown's successor. Interestingly, the local government board, who were based in Dublin, this is essentially um, um, the British government's um, uh, uh, office in Ireland, was based in Dublin Castle. And initially, whenever the corporation um, had the corporation had to inform the Irish and um, the local government board of any um, subsequent appointments that had to be approved because the Irish local government board actually paid part of the costs of the medical superintendent officer of health. The point being here that was this legislation, this public legislation that came in the 1870s, central government was trying to keep an eye on what was going going on. Their argument was that previously urban government hadn't did enough to deal with public health, so they were giving them these powers, but at the same time they were keeping an eye to see what um, how successful they were in, in, in uh, improving the health. So therefore, the corporation had to go to um, Dublin Castle and say that we want Dr. Henry Whitaker. And initially they said no, because they didn't think he was qualified. Interestingly, Belfast Corporation were adamant that they wanted, this was their man, who they wanted to be um, the, their um, successor. And he actually had to rush through, he went to Dublin and he had to complete um, a series of exams. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the position was uh, appointed in 1891. Um, Samuel Brown died in, 18, in the summer of 1890, and it took for six months there was no medical superintendent officer of health because the corporation were adamant they wanted this gentleman. So it kind of gives you an idea of their mindset. But uh, it should be pointed out that on the whole, um, the literature would suggest that he, that he was quite efficient at, at the job, but it's more the perception that uh, they had all these various external candidates and they wanted Whitaker. Looking then at his successor that came in in 1906, 
Dr. Hugh William Bailey, and no guess is what his job was before um, he became medical superintendent officer of health. He had been an alderman on the corporation as well. Once again, it was these external candidates, but they decided no, they wanted Hugh William Bailey, and by this tenor was, you know, the suggest. Um, well, this is it's not a suggestion of clientelism. It's clearly, you know, the corporation a point from within. For they're very opposed to looking elsewhere, and it's, it's not so much um, your qualifications. It's, it's more about being trusted within the local community. Um, so you have the medical superintendent, officer of health, and these three individuals who, who I deal with during my period. On under them. They're very much responsible then. Um, they're accountable to the, co um, the elected representatives on the council. Underneath him is the, ex the executive sanitary officer, who I've mentioned previously, Mr. Conway Scott, and he worked closely with him, um, the medical, medical superintendent officer, and he was responsible for sanitary matters and regulating the work of the sub-sanitary officers. The sub-sanitary officers essentially were the people, were the corporation's men on the ground, who were performing the important duties for the department by, by acting as its eyes and ears. They were each assigned to specific di districts of the town, so Belfast is split up into specific districts, and these um, sub-sanitary officers have to go out and expect them um, for nuisances, whether it's um, uh, houses that aren't being uh, erected correctly, if there's, uh, if there's drains that are overflowing, etc. Anything that they see as, as dangerous to the public health, and also checking for infectious diseases. So the, the way the department worked was that the sub-sanitary officers had to appoint every morning, um, had, had to report each morning to the executive sanitary officer, and, um, and they would receive their instructions. So it was very, um, um, so there was a clear protocol for um, how, the, how the department worked. So you would think it's, so the, it, it seems to be working quite well. I mentioned about the local government board having um, a certain degree of responsibility over what's going on in Belfast. A perfect example of this is whenever it comes to increasing the staff. Throughout my period, there's always a suggestion that um, Belfast needs more sub-sanitary officers. You know, um, there's so many. Belfast is growing so fast physically. The number of houses being erected, these sub-sanitary officers are really struggling to um, keep an eye on what's going on in their districts. And interestingly, each time the corporation goes, they have to go to the local government board and say that we need um, more money to. Uh, to, to employ sub-sanitary officers, and interestingly, they're not always given the money. So there's, a, there's an interesting dynamic here whereby um, Belfast Corporation is responsible for, responsible for public health, but at the same time, central government is also um, it also has to play its part, and there's a question about how far it's actually succeeding. An interesting point to be made is Obviously, any any um, any discussion of Belfast, we understand how it's performed as a as, as a urban city has to be put in a, in a comparative sense, and it's quite clear that Belfast um, is certainly not on par with its um, the likes of Dublin and Glasgow. Uh, uh, in Belfast, for example, in 1896, there were 19 public health staff on in, in the department, that includes the medical superintendent, doctor of health, and uh, <coughs> and uh, Conway. Conway Scott, etc. But if you compare that to Dublin, where there's 52, and Glasgow, 193. Granted, at this time, you know, the pop, um, Glasgow certainly had a larger population, but Belfast was growing quickly, and uh, the, the numbers are it's clear, you know, uh, the discrepancy. When we come to the spend, and Belfast spent £15,000 per annum on public health, whereas Glasgow, which admittedly was twice the size, spent £100,000. Now that I've, I've sort of given you an overview of the public health department and how, as I've mentioned, so it's very much um, local control, urban sanitary authorities, Belfast Corporation, but at the same time it's being, um, it's being watched by um, Dublin Castle. I would like to sort of discuss w what I think were some of the main um, public health achievements or, or, or some of the main decisions that it took during this period. So, um, first of all, housing. The generally held narrative of housing in Belfast <coughs> has been quite positive, both in terms of provision and quality. As Murray Fraser has explained in his book, from the 1840s, Belfast Corporation imposed minimum standards through private acts of parliament to ensure that the booming city had a sanitary housing stock. Therefore, Belfast never experienced the acute problems faced in Dublin and Glasgow. 
Indeed, the weekly Irish Times remarked that, quote, the hideous tenement house system has never been known in Belfast. But that's an important point to make, and a lot of it comes from the fact that Belfast grew so fast across the 19th century. Um, and, uh, and when a lot of house building came around in the 1840s, there were already standards put in place by the corporation. Therefore, um, obviously, Dublin Glasgow being older in terms of the, end, the tenement system was, was never in existence in Belfast. As was mentioned, therefore, this is some of the legislation. During the 1840s, whenever um, Belfast Corporation was first created as a, um, as a municipal um, go elected government, um, it, it, it engaged in various improvement acts and uh, to ex expend various amounts of money to try and develop the, the, the town. And for example, the Improvement Act of 1848 specified that there was not to be any flats or cellar dwellings. They were to be prohibited. And that houses were to have windows, yards, and piped water. Similarly, by this period of 1878, there was, a, there was to be a rear access to the ice pit. I'll discuss more about the ice pit in a moment, but the idea was that they didn't want people bringing essentially this kind of dirt and filth through the house. And in the 1890s, there was, there was some claims in, inner, in the inner city, but to discuss more essentially is the old housing before the 1840s being removed. The artisan during this period, um, there was a um, central government, as I'm pointing out, during the late 19th century, is starting to, uh, starting to realise that local government, as, this is both in Britain and Ireland, in the late 19th century, um, the government's starting to realise that um, urban authorities aren't doing enough to deal with public health, hence why I mentioned the, um, the, um, uh, um, the Public Health Act of the 1870s. But you also have legislation such as the Artisans and Dwellings Act, and this is essentially gives um, local um, um, urban authorities the power to remove uh, unsanitary housing, uh, and you would then build um, you would build subsequent housing. Interestingly, Belfast used this very limited uh, uh, in a limited way. The only during my period, the only um, um, street that was created through this legislation was Gresham Street. Which uh, I've always thought is quite interesting because Gresham Street and other in recent years has seen as quite something quite seedy, whereas at this time it was to be a kind of a brand new, a brand spanking new um, street. So the local government board, once again, um, who, who hold the, the purse strings, approved a loan of £12,000 for Belfast Corporation to remove 91 houses. Interestingly, um, this was the um, this was the only time that, as I say, um, Belfast Corporation actually used this uh, legislation, and part of the reason for this I will follow on to when I talk about the Belfast Improvement Act of 1878. You will probably recognise this as Royal Avenue. Royal Avenue was created out of the removal of um, Her Hercules Street, which, uh, as some of you might know, was notorious for um, it was full of butchers, etc. Um, it was very much it was seen as a very kind of unsanitary area. Where they um, previously you, you would have seen uh, um, animals, for example, livestock would have been slaughtered in Hercules Street, etc. Uh, uh, a slaughterhouse was erected by the corporation in, in the late 1860s, but um, the corporation decided they wanted to remove Hercules Street and, and they built this showpiece of the Royal Avenue. Interestingly, they decided not to use the Artisans and Dwellings Act, and one of the reasons that uh, I suggest in the thesis for this is that. Um, because by having to use the Artisans and Dwellings Act, they had to rehouse the people that um, they removed from uh, Hercules Street. So, if memory serves me right, when Hercules Street was demolished, it resulted in 550 houses being um, um, being cleared, and all all these shopkeepers, shopkeepers, etc., had had the same premises elsewhere. Because Royal Avenue was to be a very different street to what it existed previously, whereas previously Hercules Street very much unsanitary butchers. Whereas Royal Avenue was to be a showpiece whereby he would have, for example, the Ulster Reform Club. Uh, and there's also a suggestion that how far is this a public health um, initiative, or is this about um, trying to compete with what I was talking about, this kind of civic gospel, trying to compete with the likes of Birmingham Corporation Street, the Great Inn. Um, there was even talk in newspapers of the boulevards in, in Paris. So, how far, yes, this was. In the newspapers at the time, it's partly explained as a public health um, decision, but at the same time, their, their way of going about it would suggest that it's far more complicated. So yes, we can give them some credit for removing these um, these unsanitary dwellings, but it's, it's a bit more complicated than that. 
Another significant public health improvement that was taken during this period was the, uh, was, uh, um, the resolution to what was described as the Black Staff Nuisance. The Black Staff, um, as far back as the 1840s, had been essentially described as, what was it, um, it was, and I quote, virtually an open sewer for factories, ice pits and privies, where, where factories, ice pits and privies were discharged. It was very much a victim of industrial growth in Belfast. And there's reports at the time of um, it be, the smell, if, if you walk by the, the River Blackstaff, it's just generally very unsanitary. The corporation, I should point out, had been aware of the problems associated with this river from as far back as October 1846, when it received a, a, um, a deposition, so 1846. They, in fairness to the corporation, as I was, I was mentioning the improvement act, they actually got, um, they borrowed £15,000 to drain the Blackstaff River. But this never came to fruition because there was opposition from local mill owners and obviously they had a lot of influence, some of them indeed were on the corporation. It was only through what I mentioned previously, this, this Belfast Improvement Act of 1878, that this uh, river was actually um, was covered over. The Belfast, Evening, um, the Belfast Evening Telegraph reported that, quote, it would be strange if after 25 years Within my own experience of town meetings, bickering, and even variety of propositions, we are likely to solve the problem of abating part of the Blackstaff nuisance. It continued during the period mentioned, we had plenty of engineering doctors treating the patient, but somehow or other the seed of disease and death still remains. There was hope, however, when it was proposed that the plague spot around the area of Dublin Road would be converted, uh, uh, covered over with a new street being laid out. So what happens is that the corporation during the 1870s actually cover over the black the black stuff nuisance and as a result we have uh, sorry just from this this is the this is the black stuff river going through Belfast. This is a map from the eighteen fifties and the result was in covering it over we got Ormo Avenue. This was built around the same time as Royal Avenue, but obviously it, it, it never developed into the showpiece that then Royal Avenue was. Certainly one of the biggest achievements Belfast Corporation delivered in terms of public health during this period was a main drainage scheme. This had, um, like so many issues, had been discussed long before, um, um, before it, it was actually delivered. A sewage scheme, essentially the main drainage scheme was to be a sewage system of intercepting sewers to dispose of Belfast waste that had previously been um, um, which previously had been uh, essentially, as you can imagine, the people from Belfast were all essentially um, 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 built without any kind of sort of coordination and essentially just um, most of the case ran into the river lag and the black staff or sometimes straight into the lock. So the idea behind this main drainage scheme was that you would have coordinated um, sewers that, that would um, take the sewage out from um, by one means. A plan was designed by um, um, the, a previous borough surveyor, um, borough surveyor in 1866, but on the, on the occasion of the scheme it was shelved as the proposed cost cons um, was concerned and no agreement could be reached between the corporation and the harbour commissioners on a point of outfall for the disposal of the waste. This is another dynamic as well. I mentioned previously the local government board um, who, who had a check and balance on the corporation. We also have the harbour commissioners as well. They're responsible for the area around the lock. So at this time in 1866, the corporation couldn't come to agreement. However, the, the agreement was finally reached during the 1880s, and um, the result was um, certainly uh, um, what was seen as very much a, a, a great achievement in terms of uh, for, for the city as a whole. And you read in the newspapers at the time the real kind of sense of civic, civic pride. All these public health achievements are very much seen in terms of looking at what's going on elsewhere. So it's all about civic and um, civic pride. And for example, I have the the Belfast newsletter at the time reported that as every city has its own particular geographical surroundings, so the mode of discharge and disposal of sewage applicable in one case by no means determines what is advisable in the other. The, new, the newsletter continued, it is probably safe to say that few of our citizens have any real conception of the magnitude and character of the works connected with the main drainage scheme. Belfast will then have a system of drainage which will, which will compare very favourably with that of any other city of like size in the United Kingdom. 
So once again, it's very much yes, it's about public health, but it's also about showing the uh, about showing the other urban centres what Belfast can achieve. <coughs> it took about eight years for um, um it was started in 1887, and it wasn't until around 1893 that the Belfast Main Drainage Scheme had been completed. And I will say more about success later because it was quite complicated. I should also mention, in terms of uh, public baths at this time, were very much seen as improving the physical and moral health of citizens. So, Belfast's first public baths that opened in Peters Hill in 1879. And you find that uh, rate pairs then want baths in their own areas. So, you find that comes the Ormond Avenue. Templemore and the Falls Road. This is similar to um, the public park, the first public parks, um, Ormo Park in uh, 1871, and subsequently they're kind of scattered across the uh, across the city. So this is another example of um, of uh, public health and um, how the corporation is trying to respond to public health in a different way. Despite in spite of this narrative, which is kind of give thus far of you know or some effort being made while it's free getting rid of housing. Um, covered over the black stuff and uh, the main drainage scheme. There, there's, there's undoubtedly a suggestion that Belfast Corporation isn't performing that well. And in 1896, an inquiry into the health of the city was launched by the corporation and led by one of its councillors, the barrister Thomas Harson. Interestingly, in the context of the Home Rule campaign, Harson was elected in 1891 as a Liberal Unionist, <coughs> whilst receiving the endorsement of the United Trades Council in Belfast. So essentially, he's a Labour, he's a Labour candidate, but moreover, he's, at this time, Belfast Corporation was very much um, dominated by Belfast Conservatives. So he's, a, so he's an opposition voice in what previously Belfast Corporation had been led by Conservatives. So we would hope that he can give us a sort of overview of the problems that Belfast was facing without it being skewed towards a cover-up. So a resolution was put forth um, that a, a committee be formed to consider and report upon the present high death rate of Belfast and the general unsatisfactory condition of the public health of the city and to make recommendations as it may be necessary. At the time, Belfast, um, the death rate in Belfast was, 20, was um, 24 people, um, per 1,000. So for, so for every thousand, 24 people um, um, died. More striking again was the increase in those dying from infectious diseases. In moving this resolution, therefore, Thomas Harson said it was one of the most urgent that had been moved out for a long time. And you'll find that the there's certainly in the press, they're making reference to what they see as clearly um, a, a problem when it came to public health. This quote here, nothing should be left undone to grapple with this dread evil and this disgrace. Terrible it is to consider the fact that between 2,000 and 3,000 people of Belfast die every year from causes within the control of the City Council. Surely this holocaust of human life should be prevented. So essentially what happened was an inquiry was led by a number of councillors and uh, led by um, Thomas Harrison and uh, they interviewed, for example, Henry Whitaker, the executive sanitary officer, and various other individuals. And they they came forth of, uh, and they made a, and they identified what they saw as a number of problems. Firstly, the method of, remo of removal of domestic and human waste was seen as a major source of the city's problems. Previously, Dr. Whitaker reported in his annual health report the following: the most serious and difficult problem with which we have to deal is the removal and disposal of our, of our sewage waste and house refuse. At present, some 40% of houses in the city have the system of privy and ice pit combined in the small backyard. In thousands of cases, there is no back passage or means of access to this yard, and hence all the accumulated filth must be removed by carrying it through the kitchen. The removal of the matter causes a nuisance, and when any infectious disease is prevalent, would be attended with great danger in the health of the inmates. The ice pit is generally uncovered and exposed to the rain, the bottom barely paved, and no means of exit for the polluted water, but evaporation into the air or soakage into the earth to make its way under the foundations of houses. The inquiry found actually that there were 22,000 houses in Belfast without water closets, and 19,000 of these were also without rear access. So in spite of, I mentioned previously, the legend and the efforts that the corporation had taken to try and uh, ensure that uh, um, houses that were built did have um, um, rear access, a lot of them, uh, it turned out, didn't. 
Furthermore, the privies were found to be unpaved and the walls were rotten, which resulted in, the, in them leaking liquid filth. And the special committee, the point they were making was this, this is contravening the legislation that's in force and, and, and why is this happening? So it, made the, so it argued in its report, we can come to no other conclusion than that the improvement committee, the improvement committee which were responsible, responsible for building in Belfast, has practically allowed this important provision of the Public Health Act to be covered and um, to remain a dead letter and that the Public Health Committee has taken no means whatsoever to have the evil effects of this neglect remedy. So it was arguing that the Improvement Committee and Public Health Committee and Belfast Corporation weren't talking to each other. One of the big questions for the Corporation to consider was whether or not the water, cl um, the water closet system should be universally adopted. Conway Scott, who I've mentioned previously, described the existing privy and ice pit system as a wretched system opposed to all sanitary laws, which renders a speedy and systematic removal nearly impossible. Harrison, in his report, favoured the universal adoption of the water closet, telling the council, will any member explain why Belfast, a modern city, stands out unique among all other cities in the kingdom in having one house and three without a water closet, and where all the filth has to be removed through the dwelling house? He continued, it is not credible that such a state of things should have ever been allowed to arise and, it is, and it's unworthy this corporation to allow it to continue. So we'll have the situation whereby in spite of we've had this main drainage act, yet at the same time a, a lot of the, the there's no water cloth snake houses, so really we'll have this drainage system, but there's there's over nineteen thousand houses that are that are not benefiting from it at all. It should be noted, however, that there were practical problems that impeded pro progress in the universal conversion to water closets. Um, for example, uh, Belfast at this time did not have a reliable um, water supply, and, and the town's location on, a f on flat land close or below sea le level made the creation of effective drainage particularly difficult. Next, the inquiry. Uh, criticised the feeble administration in which public health legislation was adopted by the Council, in particular the Infectious Diseases Notification Act. Essentially this legislation gave sanitary officials the power to trace where infectious diseases originated and take action to stop it from spreading. The inquiry report stated that in Belfast, the butcher or baker or tailor or milk vendor may have smallpox or typhus raging in the household and our sanitary officials be ignorant of the fact. The reason that the corporation said they, they would not, or one of the reasons they said they wouldn't then adopt this legislation was because they did not have an infectious diseases hospital in which to send patients who were found to be ill. So essentially they were making the point, well, uh, we don't really want to know um, how many people have infectious diseases because then we'd have to try and find somewhere to put them. I've mentioned the housing already and how, generally speaking, uh, the housing in Belfast te tended to be of a better quality. On the other hand, it was pointed out that there were many slums in Belfast as well. Harrison made the point that there are many slums in the city, overcrowded, filthy, wanting in the most primitive description of sanitary requirements and, other, and utterly unfit for human habitation. Despite, I mentioned earlier, there was the various um, 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 acts uh, for slum clearance. Belfast um, 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 essentially didn't make use of them. The, the British government that um, w was constantly legislating. It was national legislation. It was the, uh, that was to make it easy for, for municipal authorities to take control of what it's seen as unsanitary housing and remove it. But Belfast um, ju just refused to do it. One of the serious complaints about Belfast during this time was the corporation's record in overseeing building work and regulating standards in relation to the erection of houses on landfill sites. There was legislation in place that prohibited such action. Section 25 of the Public Health Amendment Act stated that it shall not be lawful to erect a new building on any ground impregnated with fecal, animal or vegetable matter or upon which any such matter has been deposited unless and until such matter shall have been properly removed by excavation or other ways or, or shall have been rendered um, um, innocent. The point to be made here, which is quite interesting, is that it's essentially um, it's well known that you should not be building um, you should not be building any 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 houses or any buildings on um, on uh, landfill sites that have not been given time to settle and or, or they'll sink and also until uh, 
and it's it's known that any of the kind of um, the, the various unsanitary things that have been um, deposited there are, are no longer dangerous. But Belfast just uh, it, it didn't seem to matter because there was so much building going on because there, Belfast has grown so so fast and, and and there was a need for housing, so they just decided to build. The best example of this is, and I'm conscious some people have heard this one before, but it's my favourite letter ever is in it by F.W. Lockwood. He's an architect and surveyor, and he recalled his unplanned walk through York Road, and he just describes, you know, it's, it's, it's quite bizarre what they were building on. I give an exact transcript of the notes I took on what I saw in the made-up ground. Chaff, shavings, black decomposing stuff, name unknown, shavings again, paper and rags, a dead pig, meat tins, broken jam pots, miscellaneous rubbish, some curious filth which I could not identify, black earth, full of vegetable matter, but with a strong musty smell. This stuff carts were still bringing in, as I saw one during my stay. I have no hesitation in saying that whilst I saw that what I saw would not be fit to build upon before 20 years. From hence I went on and saw men working on the formation of free streets. So essentially, whilst they're bringing this in and carts are now, they're simultaneously building. All these, so far as I could see, were being made in and through exactly the same sort of material. One could suggest it gets worse, because what? Because the people that were engaged in this were actually their own, were their own um, elected representatives. This is um, Sir Donald Dixon. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and he was a he, he, he was a notorious um, 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 builder, and uh, it was known that um, he was actually getting the corporation refuse department. To, well, the allegation is he was getting Belfast, uh, the corporation refuse department, to um, um, actually bring material to um, um, to his building sites, and the sense it was filled up with uh, ash pit refuse, etc. And he was building on it. So this goes very much to the kind of the core of the corporation at this time. And, but interesting, what we find here is that Belfast Corporation, as I mentioned previously, it used to be dominated by Conservatives. By this period I'm looking at, you're starting to find the Labour and Nationals representation coming in. So therefore, these, um, um, these councillors that for years had, had really weren't accountable to anyone were, were now starting to um, feel the heat um, forced upon them. Similar problems, I should say, were found with regards to the construction of, of streets, sewers and drains. There was evidence, for example, of um, uh, a, a sewer being led on Badenburg Street off the Shekel Road with no, no point of outlet. So just put in the sewer, but there was nowhere for it to go. And this is why, I should say, there's already been a main drainage scheme created. In summary, the inquiry report recommended the following measures should be taken. An increase in the number of sanitary staff, but as I've already pointed out, you needed to get the permission from them, Dublin Castle for this to happen. An increase in water closets were possible. And the proper maintenance of ice pits. The introduction of the Notification of Infectious Diseases Act. Of course, the corporate corporation had been reluctant to do that. A list of unsanitary houses were to be compiled and that, the, and that they either be closed or put into sanitary condition. Of course, the legislation had always been there for the, these houses to be removed as necessary, and stricter controls over building regulations. Of course, the problem being that it's their own councillors that are, that are kind of flouting these regulations. The publication of the inquiry report did not go unnoticed outside of Belfast. The Dublin-based Freeman's Journal voiced its surprise, possibly with a degree of smugness, because at this time, obviously, Dublin's constantly hearing about how Belfast is surpassing and how great Belfast is, and I'm sure they were fed up, and you find that the Freeman's Journal says, We are accustomed to hear the municipal government of the northern capital lauded as ideal in contrast with cities south of the Boyne, that it is disconcerting to find so gr grave and circumstantial an exposure of the deplorable sanitary condition of Belfast. I continue, needless to say, the citizens of Belfast who have apparently been living in a fool's paradise as regards the perfection of their municipal government have been astounded by these revelations. The remedy remains in their own hands. Essentially what happened whenever it, uh, it, um, Harrison brought his report before the corporation, and as you can see in this quote here, he, he was conscious that uh, a, a lot of his fellow um, elected representatives were very much going to be opposed to this. It, it, it became political. They saw it very much as a as an attack on Belfast Conservatives, and essentially, you know, he, 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 he asked that they, um, 
they um, look at the report um, impartially and um, decide upon it, but essentially it turned out to be, you might say, a bit of a wish, uh, a whitewash, because in the end, after um, three sittings, the corporation agreed that they would uh, accept the report and give it to the various committees to come back and report upon how, um, how successful it had been. So really, um, despite this report identifying all the problems, very little in the short term was done. Of course, an examination of the death rate in Belfast is quite revealing, for it suggests that things could have been a lot worse in spite of all these infrastructural problems. Yeah. Um, Belfast's death rate was high when compared with residential cities in England, but not as bad as other manufacturing cities such as Liverpool and Manchester. And also, as I mentioned at the very beginning, Conway Scott's reference about there was almost a suggestion that it's Belfast and we have these problems, you know, that that point about you know the drink tea, there was a there was almost a a, a kind of um, an acceptance of the problems. Interestingly, you know, uh, so in summary, what does the 1896 inquiry reveal about the performance of municipal government? And uh, so this was the quote, sorry, um, that uh, Horace May said, we have heard in the past by laxity of administration, by slipshod administration, by too great a tenderness to the large owners of property. We must now, even though here, taking the reins and see that the acts passed for the protection of the public shall be faithfully and fearlessly administered. What actually happened was that, um, as, as the Lancet Journal, the Medical Journal, made the point that uh, very little in the short term happened. But what was happening in Belfast at this time in 1897 was that the boundary was going to be extended, which would allow for um, nationalists, or there was to be two new wards created in the falls and uh, uh, Smithfield that would essentially allow for nationalist councillors to come in. So this quote's making the point that, uh, but now perhaps a new year is about to dawn upon the town, and consequently the extension of the borough boundaries, another and more numerous council has just been elected. Hope that the present council will have a keener sense of its responsibilities and a higher appreciation of its duties. So I just want to look briefly at therefore the record um, in the subsequent years. There was certainly some improvement in terms of if we look at sanitary reform, the number of water closets certainly increased, and there was a de uh, the decrease in ice picks. So there was some improvement. I mentioned the main drainage scheme. The, there was two problems with the main drainage scheme, and uh, well. With one big problem, it didn't work essentially, and that there was massive flooding in 1902 in Belfast, and this result, and, and as you can see, uh, it, there was a lot of criticism at the time. And um, this cartoon here from uh, I think it's a New Man's Weekly, it was like a kind of satirical um, news, um, um, newspaper. This was um, Bratland, he was the borough surveyor who essentially designed the main drainage scheme. And it's more, and more or less being criticised for you know, the disaster it was supposed to um, stop Belfast from flooding, but um, it didn't happen. And uh, a part of one of the reasons, of course, for this was that uh, Belfast was low land, so there was going to be difficulties. In terms of post 1896 health in Belfast, the Infectious Diseases Notification Act was eventually um, um, introduced in 1897. And what we find is that there, there was a massive increase in cases from 219 in 1896 to 300 and, or 3,269 in 1897. So essentially, they've been ignorant. You know, there have been these number of infectious diseases. Due to the pressure that actually came from the Harson report, the corporation eventually opened its own fever infectious diseases hospital in 1906. Yet, there still remained um, infectious, uh, problems of infectious diseases. Typhoid, there was a typhoid epidemic in 1890. Seven and 27,000 people caught the disease. Some progress had been made with some clearance, but on the whole, so it's kind of a mixed bag here. Interestingly, there was then a public agitation, um, uh, there was then a, uh, with the increase of nationalist councillors and citizens by, by the turn of the 1900s, um, by the turn of the 1900s, were increasingly aware of the public health problems in Belfast, and therefore, despite the Harvest Inquiry, um, in 1896, there was then a decision taken that an inquiry should be led by Dublin Castle in 1906, and the outcomes um, are uh, the outcomes from this report are interesting because it, it shows that there were certainly infrastructural problems, but interestingly, it says once again that overall the death rate is the same as Manchester and lower than Liverpool and Dublin. So Belfast is quite lucky that it has infrastructural problems, yet the death rate never really seems to um, it, you could say um, the corporation got off lightly. Interestingly, it had excessive um, death rate when it came to um, um, tuberculosis. 
um, and that really due to the factories uh, compared to England and Scotland. But interesting that was to do with typhoid, as I mentioned there, 27,000 oh, um, 27, people caught the disease in 1887. And this was the evidence in the inquiry found that this was due to the, um, the known features of the history of Belfast fever are consistent with an explanation attributed in them um, to the influence, direct and indirect, of shellfish gathered from the grossly foreshores of Belfast Lock. This relates back to the main drainage scheme. The, uh, the, the drainage scheme wasn't, the idea had been that um, the sewage would be would go through a wooden chute and, and would be um, deposited out um, near um, Belfast Harbour, but essentially it, it didn't go quite far enough and therefore um, people were essentially, um, you know, when, when they were eating the shellfish, it had been contaminated. So, the Belfast main, so as a consequence of this, in 1913, there, um, the main drain scheme was improved further, whereby um, it was culverted over and it was extended out just a bit further into the lock, and the sewage was specifically only to be this spot um, deposited um, when uh, during the first um, three and a half hours of the egg tide. So there were improvements made. I should just say, I'll, I'll, I'll just finish off by saying this, generally by the end of this period, you still have issues. This inquiry found that the sanitary administration in Belfast remained woeful. And part of this, as I say, was I've mentioned the divided responsibilities. We had, you know, obviously it was um, it had to um, get permission for um, increases in salary from Dublin Castle. It, it, it had to negotiate with the harbour commissioners if, if there was any decisions to be made around the lock. And then also a point I haven't really got to explain in too much detail is that the water supply was not in the control of Belfast Corporation. It was municipalised by, or it was under the control of the water commissioners, and therefore for any big decisions, whether it was about public bonds, etc., they, they had to negotiate with the water commissioners. This report suggested that uh, there should be an overhaul of, of, of um, the urban sanitary authority, that water should be um, under the control of Belfast Corporation, and that generally the whole organisation, from the medical superintendent, officer of health, down to the sub-sanitary officers have been improved. So very much what I'm trying to show today is why some improvements were, were, were certainly made over, over the period. What you, what you get dur during the late 19th century, early 20th century, is um, a Belfast corporation that is really, its administration is a bit ad hoc and it's just generally, it's just generally not working very well. You know, it's essentially, it's, it, it's a, but at the same time, their kind of brushes are sort of, and um, are, are, um, they're quite fortunate that for whatever reason, while it's due to um, the higher wages that Belfast had, or due to the better housing generally, the death rate does not um, does not um, sort of saves um, saves the brushes of its civic leaders. Thank you. So again, leave time for questions. Okay.